So this summer we are spending um, the summer looking at the book of James, studying passage by passage um, just what James is teaching us as a body, um, for, as a church body, what James is communicating to us. And for the most part this summer, it's going to be different speakers that are sharing from this text. Um, you're going to see me very rarely up here this summer. And this is what, did someone say yay? Um, it's my stuff. <laughs> Um, so, um, but, uh, but it is a joy to be able to see these guys that have been going through this cohort and studying these passages and how God has been speaking through them. And so we've already heard from Shannon and Emily, um, and God, how God has taught them the passage and God, and then they've communicated with us. And so this morning I'm going to be speaking from pa verse ch James 1 verses 12 through verse 18, James 1, 12 through verse 18. Someone once joked that I can resist everything except temptation. I can resist everything except temptation. And some of you guys were smiling when I said that because they speak a huge truth about the human condition. Temptation pays a visit to each of us every day. And most of us struggle to say no to temptation. It's like the guy who decided that he's going to go on a diet and exercise and give up um, sweets and sugars. But every morning he has to pass by this donut store on his way to work. And so the struggle was real. This was a store that he frequented all the time. And every morning it was a fight to simply drive by the donut store and go directly to work without stopping. And every morning he would pray. And one morning he prayed, all right, Jesus, if you really want me to stop and take a break from this diet, when I b drive in front of this donut store, let there be a parking spot right there in the middle. And sure enough, there was a parking spot right there in the middle. The seventh time he went around the block, it was there for him. There is a struggle that you and I face when it comes to dealing with temptation. Let me state the obvious. You and I will not make it as a follower of Jesus if we do not learn to overcome temptation. And temptation is not new in any sense. Temptation is the same for us as it was for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan tempts you and I the same way that he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And from the very beginning, a battle has been raging for, between, for, for men and women, young and old, a battle that touches all of us sooner or later. You see, the truth is that most of the battles that we face will not be enormous, life-changing decisions, or at least we will not think of it that way when we're facing them. Either you get angry or you don't get angry. Either you stay up, stay up late and binge watch on Netflix and say, oh, just one more show, and you're exhausted the next morning when you go to work, or you go to bed at a reasonable hour and you work and you're productive in your job. Either you live within your budget or you use a credit card to buy things you think you need but you really don't need and end up in debt. Either you repeat the unkind story that was told to you or you choose not to repeat it. Either you choose to do, either you choose to do everything possible to protect yourself from the filth that's on a computer screen so you protect yourself and your family or, or you end up browsing websites that are inappropriate when no one else is looking. Either you get up early in the morning and exercise or you roll over and sleep for an extra 30 minutes. See, but the reality is that no one will know whether you exercised or not. No one will know whether you were on a website in the middle of the night looking at things that dishonors Jesus or not. Really, no one will know other than you and maybe your family whether you're drowning in credit card debt or not. No one know, will know that the reason you're exhausted is because you were out late or watching just another episode of your favorite show on TV. No one will know when was the last time you opened your Bible and read God's Word, or no one will know when was the last time you prayed. No one will know these details except yourself. No one. And yet God has ordained that our spiritual progress should not be measured by the huge battles that we face on occasion here and there, but by the thousands and thousands of daily skirmishes that we deal with when no one else will ever know about. 
So we got to ask the question, how do we deal with the trials and temptations that we face in our life, and how do we respond when we're going through these trials? And in our passage, James, the little brother of Jesus, gives us a strategy of how to overcome the deadly draw of temptation. So let's read our passage together. Let me just highlight a few things that James says here in this text to us. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be kind of first fruits of his creature. The first thing I want you to notice in our text that James tells us that in order for us to overcome temptation, we need to recognize its source. We need to recognize its source. Verse 13, James uses this word, tempted. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. See, God tests believers and unbelievers. He tests, he tries a believer's faith. We see that in the Old Testament. God tested Abraham by telling him, hey, sacrifice your son Isaac. God tested Job by allowing Satan to inflict all sorts of diseases and calamities in his life. He tests the righteous. He tests the wicked. He tests them to reveal their respective characters. With his people, with God's children, the purpose of God's test is to refine our faith like gold or silver, but because of indwelling sin, because of the existence of Satan, because we live in a corrupt world, every test that we face can also become a temptation to sin. And so it's important for us to recognize that temptation never comes from God. So we must never blame him for tempting us. You know, it's always easy to blame God for our problems. God, you put me in this situation. God, you gave me those desires. God, you knew that I was broke. God, you knew that I was weak in this area. Listen, God is never the source of your problems. Never. You cannot go there. He doesn't tempt people. He never puts you in a situation where you have to sin. Never. It's easy to even blame God for our own sin. And we can cite Bible verses and theology to back up our case. We rationalize, oh, the Bible says that God is sovereign over everything, so he has to be sovereign over the details of my life, that if he has predestined everything that before the foundation of the world, then how can I escape from doing this? God knew this was going to happen, so I'm just going to allow it. He promises that, anyway, he promises that all things will work together for good. He could have stopped me, but he didn't. What else could I do? It wasn't my fault. It's God's fault. It helps us to remember that in that verse in James 1, that word tempted can be translated as trials or temptation. It can be translated both ways. The fact teaches that in your life, any event that happens in your life can both be a trial and a temptation. It can be a trial and a temptation. God sends the trial, and Satan can turn it into a temptation in your life. For instance, you get sick, a chronic sickness. Could that sickness be a testing from God? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is always a test from God to purify your motives, your heart, to cause you to draw close to Jesus. Many good things have been accomplished when, through sickness where you're drawn to Jesus. But does Satan work through sickness? Absolutely he does. Through the exact same sickness that God is using to draw you to him, Satan will use that sickness to tempt you to despair, to anger, to bitterness, to depression. God had a good purpose in mind, but Satan is working through that which God meant for good to turn it around for evil. Or you lose your job. You say, could that be from God? It could be. If you lose your job, God probably has something else better in store for you. And he does. Often he does. 
He may have something even better than what you've imagined. He certainly, in that process, wants to build some spiritual character in your life to draw you to Jesus, to make you dependent on Jesus. And yet, through the struggle of losing your job, which is a trial from God, a test from God, in that moment, Satan will tempt you to be angry at God, to despair, to lose hope, to be discouraged. It can also work the other way around. You wake up one morning, go to work, and your boss gives you a promotion, a nice raise in your salary. Could that promotion be a test from God? Absolutely. Prosperity is a test from God to see how he will handle the blessings that he gives us. It ought to make you more generous. It ought to make you more loving. It ought to make you more sensitive to the needs of others around you because God has given you more so that you can be a blessing to more. But it's a temptation at the same time in the way that it can make you greedy. It can make you selfish. It can make you want even more than what you currently have. A trial becomes a temptation when we respond wrongly. What God means for good, Satan means for evil. Satan twists that which God gave us, and he whispers in our ears. He says, go ahead, do it. Take it. You don't, that's not enough. God has more, but he's not giving it to you. Go, do something else. No one will ever know. Just do it. And James nails that sinful line of blame shifting. He says, God cannot be tempted by evil. It is impossible because of his holy nature. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, Scripture says. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. Since God cannot be tempted by evil, it follows that he himself will not tempt someone else with evil. If we want to overcome temptation, we must right from the offset, right from the beginning, put out of our minds blame shifting, especially blaming God. We need to recognize the source of our temptation. Number two, we also need to recognize how temptation grows in our lives. How temptation grows. Look at me at verse 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed by his own evil desire. And after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. I want you to notice just a few things just in those two verses. Number one, we're all going to be tempted. At some point or another, everyone is tempted. Verse 14, each person is tempted. No one escapes temptation in this life. We sing the hymn. And it's true for all of us in this, room, in this room, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. When Satan entices you and tempts you and says, hey, this is sweet, this is good, and God says, no, I've got something better for you, we're prone to wander from God. Sin is enticing. Temptation is enticing. Secondly, the enticement of temptation. Verse 14 each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed. James uses the imagery of a fisherman with a hook, baiting a hook. Just as the fruit looked good to Eve in the Garden of Eden, sin always looks good to us. Satan always makes sin look good to us. If it didn't look good, we wouldn't sin. Satan tempts us by saying it looks so much better than it really is. Sin brings a certain degree of satisfaction. It must or none of us would ever do it. There is such a thing as pleasure of sin for a season. In the, short, in the short run, we always run. We can always, in the short run, we can always justify our anger. In the short run, we can always justify telling a lie. We can always justify cheating a friend. We can always justify taking a shortcut. We can always justify indulging in our fantasies. To overcome temptation, it's important to realize that although the initial temptation, the initial thought to sin stems from the sinful flesh. It is not sin unless we pursue it. Sin always begins in here. It always begins in the mind. No one ever falls into sin without first entertaining it in his or her mind first. But if we are careful to judge every thought, if we're careful to guard our minds and our hearts the instant they pop into our minds, you and I, we won't head down the path toward outward sinful behavior. One of the most gruesome passages in Scripture, and yet one of my favorite passages in Scripture, 
is Psalm 137, verse 9. It's pretty graphic. And it's actually shocking to find in the Bible. Here's what it says. Happy is he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. Yeah, that's in Scripture, in the Psalms. Um, the psalmist says, hey, let's take your babies and smash them against the rocks. So let me give you context here before you say that I've taught you how to smash babies this morning. The Israelites are in captivity in Babylon. They've been overtaken by this huge empire that's come in, overtaken them, taken their people, brought them to exile, and now they're suffering in bondage. And the prophet and the psalmist is sitting there and saying, man, when they were still small, if we had destroyed them, they never would have grown up and overtaken us. And they were still tiny. When they were still weak, when it was still just a thought, if we had stopped it, they never would have grown up to the point that we would be in bondage. There is a huge spiritual implication there. Sometimes you entertain a thought in your mind over and over, and it's just a thought. But if you are not careful, that thought begins to grow and begins to grow and begins to grow, and eventually it takes you into bondage. It destroys you. No one just randomly fell into sin. No one just happened to wake up one morning and realize they had a, they got into an affair. It was hundreds and thousands of thoughts that they entertained for a long, long time that kept growing and kept growing and kept growing till one day we see them fall. But it was a long process that caused them to fall. Kill the sin while it's still young. Kill the sin while it's still a thought in your mind. Don't entertain it. Consume your mind with God things so that the sin doesn't grow, develop, and destroy you one day. See, if we entertain sinful thoughts, sooner or later, Satan will present us with an outward opportunity to sin, and we will fail. But in such cases, the actual sin had been going on mentally for some time. If we make it a habit every day to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus, we will not sin in thought or deed. If we attack the sin while it's still a thought, it will never grow and destroy us. Happy is the man who takes their babies and smashes them against the rock. Happy you will be when sin, come, when temptation comes into your life, but before it grows, you destroy it because you guarantee you there will not be a day where you will be confessing sin in front of your family because you destroyed it before it took root in your life. Kill the sin before it grows. Kill the sin before it overtakes you. Third thing I want you to notice in our text is the uniqueness of temptation. His own evil desires. You know, what tempts you might not tempt me. What troubles me might not seem alluring to you at all. On any given Sunday, I'm up here preaching and looking out at you guys, and you all look good, and you wear your Sunday best, some of you guys. And as a pastor, I look at you guys, and I know that you look so much better than you really are. And I know that I look better to you than I really am. I'm not what I'm portraying to you. We look better on the outside than we are on the inside. If we knew the naked truth about each of us, none of us would want to be around each other. This room would be empty week in and week out. We'd be screaming running from the sanctuary, never to return. We differ from person to person with regard to the things that tempt us. Men differ from women, but men also differ, differ from other men. Women also differ from other women. Pride causes us to judge those who yield to certain sins that have very little appeal to us and say, how could they do such a thing? But the same pride lets us excuse our behavior, our weakness, and say things like, that's just the way I am. Humility says, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he doesn't fall. You know, 
you can put me in a room with a bag full of cocaine. I'm not touching it. I have no interest for it. I have no desire for it. But you can sit me in a room and with a bunch of other pastors and they're talking about how successful their church are, church is. You know what's creeping up inside of me? Jealousy, envy, right? What that bag of temp- cocaine might be tempting to some of you guys. I have no desire. You could sit in that room with me and listen to all these other pastors talking about how good their churches are, and it doesn't bother you. We each are different. We have to be careful of how we judge other people. Just because you don't struggle with it doesn't mean that you're better than the other person. Be careful of how you are quick to judge the people in your life. Be careful that you say, how could they do such a thing? Be careful of how you look down on a person because they had fell into one sin that you not, never fall into because if we knew your heart you wouldn't want that exposed we need to be a people of humility we need to be a people that says God it is only by your grace that I stand it is only because of your mercy and your kindness that I haven't fallen it is only your pure goodness in my life that causes me to be able to be here this morning. So we need to be wise in how we judge. And number four, I want you to see the result of temptation. I was getting way off on a sidetrack there. Um, After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. James uses this metaphor of birth. Let me apply the truth this way. James pictures lust and sin as having the ability to conceive and give birth. And while the Bible is strongly against aborting babies, when lust conceives, we need to abort that as soon as possible. We've all seen a tree growing out of a concrete sidewalk where it had split the concrete. It began as a tiny seed falling into a crack, but that seed had life in it. And the power of that life produced a tree that broke up the sidewalk. Temptation has that kind of destructive life in it. Don't let it take root in your life. You and I, we cannot trifle with temptation. We can't mess with it. We cannot play with it. We cannot dabble in it. We cannot entertain it because temptation leads to desire that leads inevitably to sin that leads, Scripture says, to death. Look at verse 15. Because in this verse, you'll see the result of allowing temptation to become sin in your life. Verse 15, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has fully grown, it gives birth to death. Twice in this verse, James uses the imagery of birth. Evil gives desire, gives birth to sin. Sin gives birth to death. Now, we prefer not to hear this. What could be happier than the birth of a baby. We decorate, we plan, we pray, we save some money, we take some pictures of the sonogram and post it on Facebook, we have baby showers, we have gender reveal parties, we send out elaborate birth announcements. It's hard to find anything more exciting, more wonderful than the birth of a baby. And yet James uses the happy image of childbirth to remind us of an awful reality. Our evil desires desires will grow over time. They will take a life of their own. And one day, those desires will give birth to sin. And when sin is conceived in the heart, it only leads to death. Death to us. Death to our relationships. That's what James means when he says sin gives birth to death. Sin kills us. Sin kills every human relationship. So it kills our relationship with God. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to the monster of death. We would be better off if we had stopped to consider the impact of our actions. What starts off as a fantasy in our mind that no one else knows about becomes a desire that becomes an overcoming impulse that leads to a foolish action that results in personal tragedy, shattered lives, hurting children, ruined careers, broken marriages. Worst of all, we end up becoming separated from God who made us. We're lost 
And the only person we have to blame is ourselves. Kill the sin before it grows and kills you. You know, if James ended the passage there, all of us would be in despair because I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of defeats when it comes to temptation in my life. But James doesn't leave us there. In the last section of our passage, he actually gives us three things we need to remember when we're tempted and going through trials in our lives. Look at verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In a sense, his whole letter is how we're supposed to respond properly when we're under pressure, when we're going through trials and tribulations. He's already reminded us that trials are a necessary part of our spiritual growth, that there is a blessing reserved for those who respond rightly in the midst of trials and temptation, that do not blame God when hard things are going on. But he tells us three things in those three verses about how to overcome temptation. Number one, he says, remember God's love. Remember God's love. Verse 16, he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Notice he calls them dear brothers and sisters, beloved brothers in some of your translations. Practically speaking, James doesn't know all these people that he's writing to. He has no idea who they are. And he's not writing and simply saying, hey, guys, I love you guys. No doubt that's true, but the phrase is more than just, hey, I love you. James is reminding his readers that they are greatly loved by God. My dear brothers and sisters, you are loved by God. They are brothers and sisters in Christ who experience the deep love of Jesus personally. He's saying, hey, brothers. Hey, sisters, when you are tempted, when you are discouraged, when you're going through hardships, when the enemy is attacking you, remember that you are loved by God. Remember how much God loves you. As one preacher said it, the pearl of the unredeemed sinner is unbelief, but the pearl of the redeemed sinner is misbelief. Misbelief. See, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're living in sin, it's because of misbelief. You misbelieve when we forget what it cost God to save you. We misbelieve when we forget the pit from which we and I have been rescued. You misbelieve when we accuse God of mistreating us. You misbelieve when you doubt that God is still with us. You misbelieve when you accuse God of abandoning you. The pearl of a redeemed sinner is misbelief. And listen, there is no cure for misbelief except place, replacing falsehood with the truth. In those moments when doubt and despair begin to sin again, when those moments when Satan begins to tempt you, you need to speak to yourself and remind yourself of the promises of God, that he is a God who will never leave you, that he is a God that will never forsake you, that he is a good shepherd, that he leads us and he guides us, that he restores us, that he renews us, that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we have nothing to fear Why? Why? Because he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. That he promises to prepare a feast before our enemies. That he will make sure that we are nourished and supplied and cared for. And our enemies are going to see us. And that surely goodness and mercy will follow us every single day of our lives. When you are tempted and when you are brought to despair, you need to speak God's truth into your life. And remind yourself that God is an absolutely good God. You need to. In those moments when you misbelieve, you need to remind yourself that you are loved by God. That you, even though you were a great sinner, that Christ himself had to die for you. You were such a sinner that Christ himself had to die for you. But you were so loved that Christ himself died for you. That he promised that even when we are unfaithful, he will remain faithful. He promises that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He promises that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You have to speak God's truth 
to your life. That he said that you can cast all of your worries and all your anxieties on him because he actually does care for you. That he promises to supply every need that you have according to the riches and glory. He promises that you are loved by God. You are loved by God. When you're tempted, remember that you are loved by God. When Satan begins to entice you with things that you know are not from God, remind yourself of how much God loves you. Number one, two, remember God's goodness. Remember God's goodness. Look at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good in this world ultimately comes from God. If it's good, God made it, or God gave it, or he sent it. The familiar words of the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. I wonder if we really believe that. Do we realize this? The Acts of the Apostle says that in him we live and move and have our being. We understand that right now we're alive because he gives us air to breathe and lungs to take in. That if God had withdrawn his hand of blessing from us, that not one of us would take another breath. We see and we hear and we move and we think and we clap and we dream and we cry and we have emotions all because of God. Yeah, I suppose we know that. Do we really believe that? Do we really let that sink in? Rarely do we stop to give thanks for the blessings that we already have. Oftentimes, we're so consumed with one issue, and it could be a big issue, but we're so consumed by that one issue that we miss out on all the many, many blessings from God. But if you, in the midst of your hardships and difficulties, you begin to pull back and say, God, you've been faithful here. You've been faithful there. You've been faithful back then. If you've been good and kind to me back then, I can trust you in the midst of this that you will be faithful here. And the same grace that brought me this far will be the same grace that will continue to lead me. Listen, if you can hear my voice, you must be alive. If you're alive, it is a gift from God. If God has given you the gift of life, instead of grumbling and complaining, why are you not thanking him? and giving him thanks. We ought to ponder Paul's question in 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? Do you boast of your wealth or your fame or your talent or your accomplishments? Do you think your good looks owe you are owed only because of your DNA? Who gave you your talents, your strengths, your creativity, your ingenuity? Who gave you the blessings that in your life that you take for granted? James emphasizes that every good gift is from the Father of lights. The imagery here is of a shower, a downpour. Mercy and goodness is falling down on you. It starts with God and moves to man. It begins in heaven and comes down to earth. You don't bargain for God's goodness because to make a bargain means you have something to give him. You and I have nothing to offer to God, and yet he still gives us mercy and grace, and kindness, and goodness every single day. We need this because we're sinners worse than we know. Even the best of us in this room would have no hope of heaven without the mercy of Jesus. If God did not forgive, and if God did not keep forgiving, if he did not continue to pour out his mercy like gentle rain from heaven, we would be utterly lost. What kind of God do we serve? He's completely good. He's constantly good. He's unchangeably good. God will never not be good. God could never be less than good. Everything he does is good. I'm sure you've been in churches where the preacher will make the statement, God is good, and the congregation says, all the time and all the time. But I heard a twist on this when I was in South Africa. Um, when I was on the missions trip last November, 
the pastor said God is good and the congregation all the time, all the time, and the congregation all, um, said God is good. And then the congregation ended with saying, I'm a witness. And I thought that was awesome. That stuck with me, and it still sticks with me, that I'm a witness. It's one thing to simply make a theological statement that God is good. That's easy. We can say that without thinking about it. But to say that I'm a witness. You and I, we don't just make that statement that God is good all the time. You and I, we're witnesses that God is good all the time. That it is his goodness that has sustained us. It is his kindness that has led us. This is why we need a God in whom there is no shadow of turning. He is still the point. He's still the point in our changing world. He's not good today and bad tomorrow. He does not randomly change his mind and decide to be kind today and evil tomorrow. You and I are like that, but God is not. When you're tempted to sin, when you're tempted to give up, remember the goodness of God. When you feel like giving in to temptation, remember the goodness of God. When you want to quit from life and resign and just say, you know what, forget it. Remember the goodness of God. Remember God's love. Remember God's goodness. And finally, remember God's grace. Verse 18, by his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. As James thinks about the goodness of God, he naturally turns to an illustration his readers would understand. The phrase gives us birth. What do we know about divine birth? We know that it starts from God. The text says that God saved us by his choice. Whatever else you can say about free will, let me be clear on one point. Salvation doesn't begin with us. You and I didn't found, find Jesus. He found us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My part in salvation was to run from God as fast as I could. God's part was to pursue me until he found me and saved me by his grace. James would agree that it is purely by his grace. If God didn't find us, we would never have found him. It starts with God. We know that divine birth has produced a new life in us. Why do we need a new life? The answer is simple. We need new life because the old life we were born when was filled with sin and disobedience to God. So James says in verse 14 and 15, lust leads to sin, sin leads to death. We know that divine birth only comes from the truth of God's word. This is why we preach God's word every week. It is not our words that bring life. I can stand up here and preach and preach, but my words are only human words. They have limitations with my flesh. My words may amuse you or comfort you or anger you or embitter you. They may instruct or they may challenge, but my words in and of themselves have no power to give life. But the word of God is absolutely different. James 4 reminds us that God's word is, or Hebrews 4 reminds us that God's word is active and alive. It is a sword that lays bare the hidden secrets of our heart. When we preach God's word in the power of God's spirit, it penetrates every heart, reveals every sin, exposes every excuse, shows us our need, and then leads us to the cross where we are reminded that we are loved and forgiven. We know that this divine birth transforms us completely. The Jewish readers in the first century were familiar with the concept of first fruits. Every year, the early part of the harvest was set aside to the Lord as a testimony that the entire harvest belonged to God. To call us first fruits means that we are a sign to the world that a great harvest is underway. That God intends for us to be on display to show the world his grace. We are to be exhibit A of what God can do through fallen, broken people. You might say, well, I'm already fallen and broken. We've got that part nailed. But God's job is to show his grace through people like us. And he's working at that day and night to make us more like Jesus. Listen, that puts our trials into perspective. 
See, when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, you will discover that nothing in life is just random. If your life seems random today, you may be, sh you may be sure that it's not finished. We're never really finished in life because God is always doing more work in each of us. As we come to the end of this message, let me wrap up by reminding our souls of the truth we've heard before. It's not about me. It's about God. It's not about now. It's about eternity. Very often, the here and now trials and temptations will not make sense to us. Listen, I have no magic formula that, will give you, that I can give you to dispel your fears or clear away your confusion or wipe away your tears. But we're reminded over and over that in each life, rain must fall. Sometimes it sprinkles, sometimes it pours, and sometimes the floodwaters threaten to overwhelm us. Said another way, if you ever get to a place where all your questions are answered and all your problems are gone and all your trials are vanquished, then sit back and relax because you've just made it to heaven. But between now and then, there will be dangers and trials and toils and snares. No one is exempt from the troubles of this life. But the grace that has brought us this far is the grace that will lead us home to God. Hope is tough. You can't really have halfway hope. Either you hope for something or you don't. Our God is good. He's faithful. He's gracious. And he loves to show those attributes to us if we pay enough attention to catch them. We've been trying to pay attention to those attributes, to hope more in what is unseen than in what is seen. I'm glad our hope doesn't depend on the fickle sway of circumstances, but on the solid rock that is God who never changes. This is what James is talking about in this passage. When temptation comes, when Satan tries to draw you away, remember God's love. When Satan says that what I'm offering you is so much better than what God can give you, remember God's goodness. When he says, hey, God is really withholding things from you, remember God's grace. A good memory of the right things will keep you strong when hard times hit. Let me close with this illustration. Imagine I had a cup, and I was going to do this, totally forgot. Um, imagine I had a cup of water that was full of mud and dirt, and it was just disgusting to look at. How do I get that dirt out? I take a cup of clean water and begin to keep pouring and keep pouring and keep pouring till the junk is gone. That's the quickest way to make transformation. And that's the parable of the Christian life. All of us are full of junk. Jesus says it. It's out of our heart that comes anger, jealousy, malice, envy, murder. All of us are like a big jar of muddy water when we come, when we come to Jesus. Some of us are muddier or slimier than others, but all of us are unclean when, we, when Jesus finds us. And it is the work of a lifetime to replace the muddy water of our sinful nature and inclination with the pure water of God's holy character. And so as you draw to him, he pours more of his spirit into you. He pours more into you. And he pours more of his love into you. And he pours more of his grace into you. Not a, nothing changes overnight. You don't wake up one day super angry and all of a sudden the next day you're just a transformed person. How do you change? God keeps pouring more of his love, more of his grace, more of his spirit in you. You're not where you need to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. And the only reason you're not where you used to be is because God has been pouring so much of his grace and kindness and his, into your life day in and day out. And so we pray, oh God, pour your love into me and drive out the anger. Oh God, pour your holiness into me and drive out the greed. Oh God, pour your purity and your holiness into me and drive out my lust. Pour your mercy into me and 
wash away my envy. Pour your patience into me, and my impatience will vanish. Pour your grace into me so that I can forgive. All that you are, Jesus, all of your shining beauty, all of it, come in this moment and fill me, consume me. Hebrews 12 says it this way, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. As we prepare to take communion, can I invite you to fix your eyes on Jesus? Fix your eyes on the Son of God who struggled in the wilderness and won the victory over the devil who won over temptation. If he won the battle, so can we, because his divine power is available to us. Before you take the elements this morning, can I invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your mind. Can I invite you to ask yourselves the question, have you forgotten God's love? Have you forgotten God's goodness? Have you forgotten God's grace? Could you be struggling with sin this morning because you forgot? Because you forgot how good he is. You forgot how much he loves you. Would you spend some time with Jesus this morning as we come to the table? Would you meditate and just allow God's love to consume you? And when you're ready this morning, I invite you to come grab the elements and celebrate the work, the finished work of Jesus that reminds us that we belong to him. So when we do communion here at Love City, we invite you to spend some time meditating. And when you're ready, come grab the elements and you can partake of it. But if you need prayer this morning, Sean and Aaron are in the back ready to pray with you. Um, so if you need someone to pray with you before you come for communion, why don't you go meet with them and then um, you can come and grab the elements.